Good evening. This is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with a very <coughs> with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of EK3CSJ in Narry Warren South. Broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and also via the Melbourne television repeater VK3RTV digital channel 1 and streaming on my YouTube stream uh, VK3CSJ. Just type in VK3CSJ in the Google search engine and uh, look for the live indicator and uh, you'll see yeah, the live stream coming from here and hopefully uh, we won't uh, lose the stream. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel broadcasting since 1988 on this frequency. Very pleasant good evenings to everybody on this uh, Good Friday, Easter weekend, long weekend. I hope everybody has a, uh, a good weekend and um, don't consume too much of the chocolate, although I believe Easter eggs are very, very expensive and nobody is buying Easter eggs as a result. How about that? Um, the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922. It comprises well over 1,600 members scattered about the country and overseas. Membership of the Society is open to anyone with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, where the letter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm at the Mulia Hall, National Herbarium, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and vision visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the library, extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory. And uh, receipt of the ASV's magazine Crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings, weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan on the ASV's telephone loan scheme and uh, as a, a method of try before you buy. Members are encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, the larger two only with appropriate training, which range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on the site is an 8.5 radio telescope, fully steerable, which members can access with a novel in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes, advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, media, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research and astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. Further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. Notifications of events are given in the Crux Extra, which is a, an extra, which is an email publication sent out to members in every other week. Please note that the ASV will conform to any government health directives. 
uh, ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed as a result of the things. If you wish to write a letter to the ASV, you can write to the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. But otherwise, like I say, the ASV's website at www.asv.org.au is the place to get all the information you require and to become a member of the ASV through the membership link, which is all done via PayPal. Okay, it's the 29th of March, uh, but Tanya Hill, the resident planetarium astronomer at Science Works, has um, produced the Sky Notes for April, and uh, nice and early, <coughs> so the 1st of April being Monday, and uh, I think um, Daylight Savings this week uh, finishes this weekend too, I think, because of the following weekend. Um, it's something I should check earlier in the piece, but I didn't. Um, let me just have a quick look at that. Daylight saving for Victoria for 2024. And uh, daylight saving time. Oh, tired, I am tired tonight. 7th of April, we go back an hour, so it's not this weekend, but in fact next Sunday, Next, not this Sunday coming, but uh, the next Sunday, a week away, 7th of April, is when it all changes, back to normal. Um, alrighty then, Sky Notes, let's see what Tanya Hill has got for us this time around. Um, all right, are we all hanging in there? Yep, YouTube stream still there, and uh, I'm trying desperately not to uh, have not to have too much audio on the YouTube stream because I uh, last time I listened to it, it was shocking. I was distorting all the way through. Um, let me just uh, check that for one, two, three, four. Okay, I've just upped the level a little bit, um, but I'm just making sure that it clips just into the red rather than severely. Um, all right, Sky Notes. Uh, Tanya has written. Um, yeah, okay. Star trails, city trails, and lightning flashes seen from orbit. And uh, she's got here that the Earth and space has, as captured by NASA's Dr. Donald Petit, uh, who currently holds the record as of this month as the oldest active astronaut Dr. Donald Petit um, there are two extraordinary views of our planet taken by him from the International Space Station the first in 2022 and the second in 2023 and I shall bring up that image uh, let me see where is it there it is Okay, uh, as the Earth rotates and the camera shutter stays open, stars appear as lines centered on one of our planet's celestial poles. The locations in space the Earth's axis points to, <clears throat> with the International Space Station moving at 8 kilometers per second, taking 90 minutes for one orbit City lights below are smeared into lines as well. Flashes of lightning from numerous storms speckle in the image too. So all the streaks are city lights and all the little speckles of light are lightning. It's interesting. And of course the um, standard polar um, uh, movement, movement of stars there in the in the background of this image and there's a, another image as well uh, to bring up uh, which has the International Space, International Space Station in shot <clears throat> going back to the notes um, a stunning 
long exposure view of star trails and city trail city light trails and lightning flashes caught by the US astronaut Donald Petit in 2022 from the International Space Station Earth's atmosphere is the narrow green band that we see at the top of the picture there or in the middle um, although uh, through which star trails can be seen appearing by uh, air glow as the planet's entire upper atmosphere is excited by incoming solar radiation and uh, a similar time this one here what I've got on the screen right now a similar time elapse by Donald Petit with part of the space station seen at top center for this 16th March 2023 image multiplied 30 second exposures by internally mounted camera were combined fainter concentric trails at the top are from other international space station modules or solar arrays moving independently during some of the exposures those on board the international space station often take photos from inside the window cupola which gives spectacular views of the earth although remotely controlled cameras mounted inside this station are also mounted uh, or also, also used i should say and there's a picture of that here as well and that's what it looks like from outside looking in a little uh, what they refer to as a cupola yes it would be rather spectacular being inside there the international space station seven widowed windowed sorry <laughs> the international space station seven windowed cupola offers superb views of earth and space as nasa's astronaut josh cassander can be seen enjoying in this image from the expedition 68 of 2022-2023 pretty good all right continuing on with the sky notes um and uh, where's my camera there it is uh, Melbourne Sun Times if you're interested in knowing the rise and fall uh, daylight saving oh she's even written it here daylight saving ends at 3 a.m. Sunday the 7th of April with the clocks turned back one hour so on the 1st of April sunrise will be at 7 34 a.m. setting at 7 13 Monday the 11th it'll be rising at 6 43 a.m. and setting at 5 58 Friday the 21st rising at 6 52 setting at 5 44 and by the end of the month Sunday the 30th rising at 7 a.m. sitting at 5 33 p.m. so our nights get a little longer with the darkness seeping in too early moon phases there's a third quarter on tuesday the second there's a new moon on tuesday the ninth and uh, there's a first quarter on tuesday the 16th and a full moon on wednesday the 24th lunar distances lunar perigee closest to the earth is on monday the 8th at 3580 sorry 358850 kilometers and lunar apogee furthest from earth is on monday the 20th at 405623 kilometers planets in a nutshell mercury is in front of the sun this month uh, its inferior solar conjunction and not therefore visible venus rises in the east around 5 30 a.m early in the morning and a little later each morning but fades in the dawn light by 6 20 a.m yes i've noticed that little bright object in the sky mars is visible high in the east from 3 40 a.m a little later each night before fading in the morning light by around 6 a.m 
Jupiter is about to move behind the Sun for its superior solar conjunction but can still be seen high in the northwest from around 3.40 a.m. before fading by 6 a.m. in pre-dawn light. By late April, it will no longer be visible. Saturn can be seen from 3.40 a.m. early in the month in the east and then a little earlier each night before it is lost in the dawn light. Meteors, the April's main shower, the Lyrids, L-Y-R-I-D-S, Lyrids, is centred near the bright star Vega, uh, low in the north at 3 a.m. It is active from the 16th to the 25th, peaking on the 22nd and 23rd. So all you... Um, uh, meteor, um, what's the term they use for that? Meteor scatter, I think that's what it is called. Meteor scatter uh, attempts, uh, look out for that on the 22nd, 22nd to 23rd for attempts to use meteor scatter for uh, VHF over the horizon comms. I wonder if people still do that, actually. <laughs> um, all right. Better placed is the pipe puppets associated with the comet Grieg um, Skull Jorup, which peaks on the 24th, centered low in the southwest near Canopus in Carina. So there's two, two media showers this month. Uh, the <coughs> Excuse me, the Lyrids. Um, centered in Vega, peaking the 22nd, 23rd, and uh, the Pi Puppids associated with Comet Grieg, uh, which peaks on the 24th, centered low in the southwest near Canopus. Use um, astronomy, doctor, uh, astronomy, no, use um, uh, Heavens Above, the Heavens Above app, uh, to be able to get a an idea of when things are happening. Stars and constellations. And there's a picture here she's got for this one. Uh, did I bring it across? Did I, did I bring it across? Maybe I didn't bring it across. I might not have even saved it. Uh, okay, it doesn't really matter, I don't think. Um, while I'm talking, let's just see if I can quickly get it across. Um, oh, it should be there. It is there. Oh, Struth Clint. I have got it there. But I haven't brought it into vMix. That's what I haven't done. So let me just browse my file. There it is. Open that. Okay, it's there. And there she blows. And put it across. And here we go. All right. Uh, in the south, if we turn our chairs and open our observatories towards the south, the Southern Cross, which is on screen as we speak, can be found on its side in the southeast with the two pointers below it. Um, to the right of the cross in the southern southeast, sorry, southwestern sky is the star Canopus, which is the second brightest star in the night sky. Low in the south is Achenar which is the head of the river Erendinus. Akana never sets in Melbourne, uh, and it is called a circumpolar star as a result, and it moves through a half circle around the south celestial pole during the night as Earth rotates on its axis. And with this image, sorry, um, here, here is the night sky taken by the AAT, of the region containing the Southern Cross or Crux on your screen right now and uh, the nearby pointers. The Anglo-Australian Telescope forms part of the Australian Telescope Observatory, AAO, at Siding Spring in New South Wales, which hosts a variety of telescopes and detectors studying the sky. 
The image above, or well, the image on the screen, reveals a region of the galaxy densely packed with millions of stars. Their true colours seen in long exposures like this one reveal their surface temperature. Blue white for the hottest stars, orange yellow for the, those that are cooler, and red for the coolest. That's cool, man. The dark coal sack just uh, sorry, the, the the dark coal <laughs> the dark coal sack dust cloud sits at center with the five stars of the southern cross and to the left are the two pointers. So yes, yeah, so that little dark patch in the middle there is the uh, is the coal sack which can no longer really be seen from city areas because of light haze. I can remember seeing it as a kid from East Dandenong, uh, but uh, now almost impossible. Um, but uh, I remember being up at the, the ASV's dark sky site and uh, breaking my neck looking up at the sky. And uh, I could... Um, I could quite clearly see by eye this coal sack. It just stood out, and I thought, "Wow, well, isn't it just amazing?" Um, all right. So the dark coal sack dust cloud sits centre with the five stars of the Southern Cross, and to the left are the two pointers Alpha and Beta Centauri, with the brighter at far left being Alpha Centauri, a triple star system, and our sun's immediate neighbours. In the southwest, if uh, if a dark location, uh, sorry, if oh, that's what it says, if a dark location, I wonder if it should be just at or in. In a dark location, you can see the large and small clouds of Magellan, two small neighboring galaxies to our own Milky Way. They appear as irregular fuzzy patches isolated from the broad band of stars that runs across the sky, which is our edge on view of our own galaxy. In less light polluted skies, you can also see the Milky Way several dark regions uh, uh, that, are, that are vast clouds of dust. Whilst we may see a few foreground stars, the dark star areas, the dark areas behind obscure our view of more distant stars of the galaxy. Looking towards the west, you've got Orion, the hunter, uh, is in the west, lying almost on his side with the red giant star Betelgeuse as one of his shoulders. The three bright stars that form an obvious line are al Nittak and al Nilm and Mintaka. They mark his belt and also conveniently the base of the local saucepan asterism. The handle of the saucepan is Orion's scabbard, uh, which hangs from his belt. Continuing with the belt, st uh, or conti yes, continuing the belt stars above and a little to the right, which uh, we, we reach Cirrus. The brightest star in the night sky and the principal star in Kansas Major, um, which is one of the Orion's hunter dogs. Below Sirius is the northwest. Uh, below Sirius in the northwest is Procyon or Procyon, which marks the position of his lesser or smaller dog, Kansas Minor. You have to be pretty familiar with constellations and how they look in the sky to get a, a, a gist of how I'm describing this. It's always a bit of a, a tricky one uh, if, if you're not familiar with constellations. Below Orion and drawing closer to the horizon during the month is Hydes, an open group of stars uh, that form a sideways wedge or V. This is the triangular head of Taurus the Bull uh, with his angry eye as the red giant star Aldebaran on the corner. Looking towards the north. In the north, but upside down from our southern hemisphere perspective, is Leo the Lion. This constellation is easily recognised by the hook shape, or inverted backward question mark, of stars that forms the mane on the lion's head and shoulders. To the left of Leo 
and closer together are the two bright stars, Castor and Pollux. <laughs> the principal stars in the constellation of Gemini, the twins, which appears upside down as well from southern latitudes. Turning to the east, finally, later this month and in May, into May, the spectacular constellation of Scorpius will begin its return to our evening skies. This is one of the largest constellations and when it appears low in the east you can easily identify to the left its long curving tail leading to its body containing the red giant star Antares making it its heart and to the right its pinches reaching out and um, they never, Tanya never really mentions it but I always do when, you, when you're looking at Sagittarius uh, you're, you're actually looking towards the center of our galaxy to some 26,000 light years away that general part of the sky the International Space Station orbits every 90 minutes uh, at an average distance of 400 kilometers, appearing like a bright star moving slowly across the night sky. Here are some of the brightest passes expected this month over Melbourne and central Victoria. Uh, and the valley really got just, just the one date here, really. Um, Sunday the 14th of April there's a passing at 6.58 p.m. to 7.03 p.m. coming in from the north northwest to the east southeast that's that's the only date they've given but as they say here refer to heavens above website which gives predictions for visible passes of space stations and major satellites live sky views 3d visualizations be sure to first enter your location under configuration for more ac for accurate um, for accuracy in that particular location you're tuned to asv radio vk3 echo kilo hotel there's a bunch of dates here but i won't go through them all um actually it's not that many really but anyway on the 1st of april 1948, Alpha, Beta, and Gamal published their famous paper on the Hot Big Bang. 1948. 2nd of April, 1845, Fitzal and Folkolt take the first photograph of the Sun. On the 3rd of April, 1966, Luna 10 became the first spacecraft to orbit the Moon. On the 7th of April 1973, Pioneer 11 probe launched to Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, on the 8th of April 1732, birth of David Rittenhouse, who determined Earth-Sun distance of 150 million kilometres, 1732. On the 9th of April 1959, NASA's first cohort of astronauts, the Mercury 7, are announced. On the 11th of April 1905, Einstein's special theory of relativity is published. Also on the 11th of April 1970, Apollo 13 was launched on its ill-fated mission. On the 12th of April 1633, Galileo's trial by the Catholic Inquisition on the question of the sun-centered solar system begins in Rome. Also on the 12th of April 1961, Yuri Gagarin, USSR, became the first human in space orbiting Earth for 108 minutes in Vostok 1. Also on the 12th of April 1981, Columbia, USA, was the first space shuttle to be launched. On the 14th of April 1629, birth of Christian Huygens, who explained Saturn's rings and discovered its largest moon, Titan. And one more date, the 16th of April 1495, birth of Petros Apatinus, who, who established that cometary, cometary tales at all times point away from the sun 1495 amazing 
There's a few more dates there, but I'll leave that to another time. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, broadcasting on 3541 kHz in the 80 metre amateur radio band and also via the wonderful Melbourne television repeater, VK3 RTV Digital Channel 1 and also via my YouTube channel streaming on VK3 CSJ's channel. How's that? And it hasn't fallen over yet. So I hope my audio is okay on YouTube. Oh, oh, you know the oh damn, I have um, I have not set up my computer for Discord and my email. I completely forgot to do that. <sighs> well, wouldn't it bother you? Um, yes, uh, I don't have it. I just remembered. Um, blow me down. Let's see if I can quickly check my email here on this computer. Um, yes, yes, there is, um, who have we got, the, 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 the VCL factor, and the Stephen factor is there, he's given me 59, 30 over 9, and, um, and what's this, what are you saying, uh, usual large signal here this evening, no visions this good Friday, <laughs> you need a stronger drink, I think, Wayne, uh, audio is big and nice to listen to. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Wayne. Good on you, mate. And Stephen, they're bearing up. Hurry up. All right, I am. Um, okay, so I can view my email. So if anybody wishes to send me an email, I can view it because it's just here on my screen in front of me. But Discord, bloody Discord. Anyway... <laughs> So I shall catch up with those watching uh, on Discord a little later on at about 3 o'clock in the morning. This is interesting. This next article is a fascinating image. Please tune into my YouTube channel if you're not receiving ATV because this is bloody good. Where's the article though? Let me find. Oh, here it is. Okay. The Milky Way's central black hole could have a hidden jet. A new analysis of our galaxy's supermassive black hole in polarized light, and this is important, polarized light reveals more structure than astronomers ever expected. March 27, 2024. At 4 million times the mass of the Sun, the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy is rather humdrum. As far as supermassive black holes go, but a new analysis reveals that it is not lo- it, that it's a lot more like a, a larger cousin cousins than scientists thought. It may even be able to harness its magnetic field to fire out a jet of material, a smaller version of the jets produced by the most powerful, ferocious black holes. These findings come courtesy of the Event Horizon Telescope, EHT, the same international team of researchers that in 2022 released the first picture of light bent around the Milky Way's central black hole, which is called Sagittarius A, or Sagar A. Pronounce Sag A, Sag, Sag A star for short. Um, the New York, yeah, sorry, yeah, New York. <laughs> I am tired. The new work reveals how the light is polarized, meaning how the electromagnetic waves that make up the light are orientated. This feature is imprinted on light by the black hole's intense magnetic fields and can tell astronomers how strong and organized that those magnetic fields are. The team's visualization of the polarization data reveals a pronounced spiral structure structure, around the black hole. (laughs) Sagittarius, <laughs> suggesting that Sagittarius A has a surprisingly well-behaved magnetic field. I know you're all hanging out for it, so I'm going to bring this image up right now while the text is still there. So it, this is really amazing image. The resolution is just stunning. All right, back to the article. 
uh, <clears throat> perhaps perhaps uh, orderly enough to funnel material into a jet blasting gas and energy back into its surrounding cosmos. Astronomers have yet to, to detect that jet, but if they do, it might imply that almost every galaxy may have a hidden jet lurking at its centre, but that we actually usually miss them because they are simply too weak, says Angelo Ricart, a fellow of the Centre of Astrophysics, Harvard, Smithsonian in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and one of the lead leaders of the polarisation polarization analysis, full stop. And that, in turn, could have far-ranging cosmological implications as the presence of a jet can greatly impact the course of a galaxy's life. The possibility of a jet hidden in our own galactic backyard is intriguing, uh, says a fellow radio astronomer who was not involved in the work, uh, but says, well, the claim of a hidden jet will definitely keep theorists busy for years she says so the eye of the storm the eht took its first observations in 2017 by training eight radio telescopes around the globe to black holes onto on two black holes sagittarius a in the milky way and also the black hole at the center of galaxy m87 by linking the telescopes together, scientists could obtain data with the effective resolution of an Earth-sized telescope. Although M87's central black hole is 55 million light-years distant, it, it's also much larger than Sagittarius A, appearing roughly the same size on the sky. And because it's, it is larger... M87's overall appearance doesn't change as quickly in the same way that a hurricane doesn't change its appearance as quickly as a tornado. And there's an image here of these two. Uh, bring that up. There they are, M87 and Sagittarius A side by side. This made processing the data of M87 much easier, leading the EHT team members to tackle it first. In 2019, they released their portrait of M87, the first ever image of a, of a black hole's shadow. They followed this up with an analysis of polarization of light around M87 published in 2021, which revealed a spiraling pattern of polarization. Next up was Sagittarius A, but its dynamic ever-changing nature proved to be much more difficult to tame. In 2022, the EHT realized their initial image of Sag Sagittarius A, which reflected an average of total light required by the telescopes. Uh, that was already a huge challenge because of all the techniques we had developed for M87 were broken by Sagittarius A, says CFA fellow and project so co-leader Sarah Isuan. Isuan led the observational aspects of the polarization work. Soon after, the team turned to the even bigger challenge of, of extracting a polarization image from Sagittarius A data but they had low expectations. We didn't expect to see anything. It is even more challenging than working with total light, and so there's a lot more detail and a lot more care to, in extracting that information, she says. On top of that, the team also expected that relatively small size of Sagittarius A to result in a weak turbulent magnetic field and therefore a chaotic and disorganized polarization signal. But to the team's and her colleagues' surprise, they quickly began to see signs of structure, much like what they had seen in M87. The team then spent a whole lot of time tuning, tuning their imaging software, training it on simulated observations, and when they finally unleashed their upgraded models on the real data, the spiral structure came out again super easily. And then we thought, okay, we got the real structure. Honestly, one of the most surprising things is that we actually managed to get something to show people and not just some statistical plots of what there might be there. 
Other astronomers are struck too by the similarities between the two black holes. It is surprising that Sagittarius A and M87 would have similar magnetic fields as they were, as they are two very different supermassive black holes. Just comparing the masses of the two black holes, if Sagittarius A were the equivalent of the mass of Earth, M87 on that scale would be the planet would be a planet five times the mass of Jupiter. I'll leave that article there, but that's courtesy of astronomy.com if you want to follow that up any further. Uh, it really is quite an uh, amazing image to, uh, to see. Um, polarization, it really uh, brings in an interesting resolution and detail of what's happening around a, uh, a black hole. These images are getting sharper and sharper and sharper, so uh, <laughs> stay tuned for more interesting imagery. Um, all right, where's my camera? There I am. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, <clears throat> the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. SpaceX delays its launch of 20, another 22 Starlink satellites from California. More pollution in the sky. Liftoff is now scheduled for no earlier than 10.30 p.m. Um, Friday, March 29 in America. <coughs> Excuse me. SpaceX has reset the launch of another batch of its Starlink internet satellites to no sooner than Friday evening, March 29. So um, there is a website that allows you to work out when the Starlink train of satellites goes overhead. If you go to, um, uh, I know I've got the link here somewhere, but this article I'm looking at right now is courtesy of space.com. Space.com. SpaceX delays launch of 22 Starlink satellites from California. In the body of this, this uh, um, um, news item, they give you a link of how to look out for SpaceX's uh, train of satellites overhead. Um, I believe um, um, heavensabove.com uh, also may have that information as well. Uh, all right, next. Um, oh, this is interesting. Uh, a new theory might explain our sun's wacky rotation, 29th of March, courtesy of sciencealert.com. The sun's rotation is, in a word, bizarre, apparently. You'd sort of expect every latitude of its surface to spin at more or less the same rate, but no. If you could stand on the sun's equator, for example, it would take approximately 24 Earth days to undergo a full rotation. If you stood on either of the poles, it would take around 34 days to return to your original orientation. This is known as differential rotation and has puzzled scientists for a long time. It is known as differential rotation, and I've just read that out. It's only become more puzzling as we probe deeper and deeper into the solar interior. Helioseismological observations reveal that the phenomenon is not restricted to the upper atmosphere. It extends down some 200,000 kilometers through the entire solar convention zone. Convection zone. Now, a team led by solar physicist Yoto Becky of the Max Planck Institute have figured out a clue. The differential rotation seems to be reined in by long period oscillations of sound waves in the convection zone that can be detected on the surface as swirling motions around the poles. And there is an image here of this. I shall bring that up. Uh, there it is. And across we go. Actually, it's not. Well, it's a similar thing, image. This, what what you see on the screen at the moment, is a three-dimensional visualization of the high-latitude oscillations that they're referring to. It's only become more puzzling as we probe deeper and deeper into the solar interior. Now a team led by solar physicists da, 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 have figured out a clue, and I've read all that. Where am I? 
um, down here below that. Okay, the sun is constantly humming. The sun is constantly humming. The visual surface layer known as the photosphere is buzzing with millions of acoustic oscillation modes, raising, raising, rising and falling in periods of around five minutes. We've known about these modes for a while, but just a few years ago, a team of researchers led by the MPS director, Laurent Gizen, found a new type of acoustic oscillation. Using several years' worth of solar observational data, they found a global oscillation mode with a far longer 27-day 20, period. And there was something else. These giant sound waves rippling through the sun seem to be linked somehow to the solar differential ro rotation. And there is a video here. I've got, it just goes for 30 seconds. But I'll, I'll run this, this video. I don't know if there's any sound, but I, well, I'll, I'll just mute if, whatever there is. If I can find this uh, YouTube thing. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Um, okay, let's cut to it. I'll kill the audio that's there. Okay, and I'll put it on a loop because it's just 30 seconds worth. All right, going back to the article. Um, <coughs> and there was something else. These giant sound waves rippling through the sun seem to be linked somehow to the solar differential rotation. Back in 2021, with when the original finding was published, the researchers thought that the long-term oscillation mode relied on differential rotation, but on closer investigation, they found that the relationship goes both ways. The differential rotation is curtailed by the giant sound waves. So to investigate the relationship between the two, he, the, the team and uh, colleagues conducted three-dimensional numeral simulations uh, exploring the effects of oscillations. The researchers found that the modes of high latitudes, those that circle the poles, have a profound effect on the sun's behaviour by transporting heat from the poles to the equatorial region. Because the poles are warmer than the equator, this heat transport limits the temperature difference between the two latitudinal regions. It means that the contrast between the poles and the, equ the equator cannot exceed 7 Kelvin. 7 Kelvin, which is 7 degrees Celsius. My goodness. Although this difference is tiny, kidding, then... Talking about a ball of hot plasma that rolls the thousands of that rolls at a thousands of degrees, it's this temperature range that ultimately controls the differential rotation. Righto. Continuing on, the last paragraph. This very small temperature difference between the poles and the equator controls the angular momentum balance in the sun and thus is an important feedback mechanism of the sun's global dynamics. Although the processes are different in some ways, it's similar to the way atmospheric instabilities can produce giant cyclonic storms on Earth. And while there is still quite a mystery to be solved, the link between the processes could help us get there. The high latitude oscillation modes play a significant role in guiding the sun's differential rotation and perhaps the same dynamics are at play on other stars. The sun is a ball of old hinky ball of flame in the sky, a ball of mysteries and enigmas. Little by little we are getting closer to resolving them, the scientists say. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was um, an interesting one as well. Uh, where's my camera? There it is. Okay, at 10 minutes to 11, we have... What's next? Uh, the Japanese moon lander is still alive. Um, Japan's SLIM, L-S-I-M, Japan's SLIM moon lander survives its second lunar night. And there's a photo taken of the moon surface. And uh, there it is. Bring that up. And um, they're saying here... 
<coughs> Slim's not dead yet. The Slim spacecraft, Japan's first ever successful moon lander, has survived the long, cold lunar night on the second time. For the second time, mission team members announced the, the news via X. I guess it's Twitter on Wednesday. In a post that also featured a photo newly snapped by the lander's navigation camera, which is what's on the screen right now. Slim, whose name is short for Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, launched last September and landed on Jan 19, making Japan just the fifth nation to pull off a soft landing touchdown. The solar-powered slim landed on its nose that day, a less than optimal orientation for harvesting sunlight. The 200 kilogram probe went dark shortly afterward, but they woke up on Jan 28 and began gathering data. The mission's team put slim into hibernation a few days later, ahead of two-week-long lunar night, during which the surface temperature is located is uh, at its local dropped to around minus 208 degrees Fahrenheit or 130 degrees Celsius. SLIM has already achieved its primary mission goals, making a precision, precision touchdown and deploying two tiny rovers conducting a variety of science work. Um, by that point, uh, that has not expected to open eyes again, but the probe did so, waking up just last late last month. So there it is. Slim is still alive and doing things. That's great to see. All right, a little plug for astrophys.com. Uh, where's my slide? Um, there it goes. Um, uh, Brendan O'Brien hosts an exceptional astronomy podcast with two big episodes each month. On the 15th of each month, we interview leading astrophysicists and related experts from all over the world about astrophysics, astrophotography, space science, big data, astro AI and particle physics. On the first of each month uh, is Dr. Ian Astroblog Musgrave, uh, which gives uh, us the his monthly sky guide plus a unique astrophotography challenge. So uh, Dr. Ian Musgrave is the... Um, a regular visitor there on Astrophys giving a, a rundown of what's in the sky for April. So that's episode 189, which is available to listen to right now. Brendan's brought the release of the episode a bit earlier for the sake of the long weekend. Good idea, Brendan. So take a listen to it. Um, all very good stuff. But there's a heap of other things there, all worthwhile listening to. Um, and uh, let me plug also Mount Burnett. Um, there we go. Um, if you're not aware, um, there is a perfectly good observatory up at Mount Burnett in the hills, Jimbrook location. And uh, just visit the uh, website, Mount Burnett, uh, or I should say m mbo.org.au www.mbo.org.au for more information about the uh, Mount Burnett Observatory. Um, they have a, a number of events that uh, are occurring. Uh, every Friday night they generally visit or meet up there and if the sky is clear they will uh, open up the dome which you can see on the screen there. It used to belong to uh, Monash University um, a long, long time ago. Um, but now is in the care of a local group of astronomers doing great things. They also do radio astronomy up there. There's a radio astronomy group, and uh, they're they're also using the property up there for a couple of basic experiments that uh, that are on, on going on. Um, okay, a uh, bit of a plug for that. And um, what's next on the list here? Oh yeah, okay, I've got time to squeeze this in. This is courtesy of Kate Green, our resident space exploration section director for the ASV. Kate is extremely active on finding news articles on our Facebook page. Good on you, Kate, for what you do. Um, and, uh, oh, um, Graham has sent me something. Is he? I don't know. I'll cl close it anyway. <laughs> Um, okay, um, 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 there's an image here I'll bring up. So where are we? Where are we? There it is. Okay, does it fit on the screen? I think it, I'm not sure if that really fits on the screen. Anyway, 
Um, a new design for a small, highly sensitive Galvi meter that can operate stably at room temperature, March 27, 2024. A team of physicists and engineers aff affiliated with several institutions in China has developed a new kind of a new kind of small, highly sensitive Gavi meter, or sorry, Grav, Gravi meter, that can operate stably at room temperature. In their project reported in Journal Physics Review Letters, the group de developed a dual magnet strategy that used a laser to measure changes in gravity. Gravity measurement devices have existed for some time. Unfortunately, the two main types have drawbacks. Uh, those based on small isolations tend to age quickly, resulting in loss of precision, and those based on superconducting materials require cold containers, which means they, they uh, use a lot of power and are difficult to move around. In this new effort, the research team took a new approach. They built a device with a large magnet inside a cabinet affixed to its top in the center. They then added a small magnet they then added a small magnet beneath it and housed it in a field repelling graphite shell. The opposing magnetism caused a smaller magnet to levitate. The slight repulsion also resulted in vertical oscillations. Adjusting for space between the magnets allowed the team to reduce it to just one hertz. The team then added a wire that hung down from the bigger magnet. Its movement up and down represented changes in gravitational pull. That movement was measured using a vertical laser that experienced various degrees of intensity as it was blocked by the wire as it moved. Measurement of such changes allowed for calculating the amount of gravity being experienced by the device. The team tested their device by putting it in a vacuum chamber for several weeks, allowing it to settle. It then used they then used it to take measurements of gravity th from the moon and sun over following days. They then compared the results with predicted values and found their signal displayed oscillations that re represented variations in gravitational acceleration of up to about 10. 10.7 of standard value, which they described as highly accurate. The team describes their work as proof of concept device and suggests that further work would likely lead to refinement, which in turn should lead to even greater precision. They also plan to make the device more physically robust so that they can withstand even being moved from site to site. And uh, yeah, so uh, um, uh, in the image, there's a uh, on the screen the the schematic uh, of the diamagnetic levitation gravimeter. Schematic of the oscillation displacement detection. The laser beam is focused by a lens. The copper wire is placed on the focal point where displacement sensitivity in the z direction is maximum. The measured response curve of voltage to displacement in the z direction, which is what's being described in this image on screen. So I thought that was a rather interesting uh, uh, development to occur. Okay, I think we're coming up to some space weather now. Oh, actually, there is something here. Um, something else I was going to do. This is a, vi a visual thing, so for those watching YouTube and um, and the RTV, um, I'll probably let me bring my camera back up. All right, and I'll queue up this now. <coughs> we have a, a resident uh, um, um, astrophotographer in the ASV. Uh, he's only been a member of the ASV for a short while, not not a, I don't believe a very long time, uh, but his his name's Eddie Peng, and he has an amazing eye <laughs> for taking photographs of the sky, and uh, I say what I say is that his his camera system is is um, well is it fairly extensive, and I've got an image of Eddie here with his his kit, uh, so to speak. 
there he is, and his cameras. That's just one of some of his cameras. He's actually got a, a range of uh, other cameras and telescopes, but that's the main one of his main cameras um, and telescopes that he uses to take these following images. Um, where's this video? Um, now, this this is just this goes for two minutes, but this is this is a com uh, uh, there's a, a group that's compiled. Uh, a number of images that Eddie has taken on his behalf and um, it really is the most stunning uh, um, accumulation of his images nicely presented in this this two-minute video um, and I think there is some soundtrack there which I'll see if I can just kill it because I think it's just uh, music of some degree <coughs> so we can uh, get rid of that um, but yes, as we progress through this this this, this two-minute video, we see images taken of distant nebula and galaxies and um, objects that are deep in space, uh, taken with a uh, suitably sensitive camera uh, on a reasonably good telescope. And these, this is the sort of thing I'm, I'm hoping to get into myself um, with when I finally get my dome assembled and a telescope set up. I, I might a lot of these images were taken from the dark sky site up at ASV's dark sky site at north of Heathcote. Um, but any chance that Eddie gets to take his telescopes out to a dark sky, any dark sky location, he will. And, uh, and he just sits there for the whole night collecting data, hours and hours of faint light data, and then uh, processes it using special computer program to get these absolutely amazing images. You, you just think that um, uh, it was impossible to do it, but it is possible to get these sorts of images if you, if you know what you're doing. So good on you, Eddie, uh, and excellent uh, uh that uh, this this particular mob uh, collected uh, your uh, your videos and put them together in this concise little two minute uh, run and there's a little thank you so much Eddie at the uh, at the back at the end of it there so uh, <laughs> um, I thought that was just fantastic and um, you know and Eddie's absolutely uh, chuffed over the seeing his images presented in a short video like that which is now on YouTube. So uh, excellent stuff, um, yeah, thumbs up for, uh, for doing some excellent work, uh, Eddie, and uh, I hope to be able to uh, follow suit at some stage in the near future. All right, spaceweather.com. Uh, this is the oops, wrong thing to do. Uh, this is the current sun. Um, where are we? I know I saved it. I know I saved it, but I can't see it. Uh, heavensabove.com um, <laughs> I haven't moved it across I, I've saved it, there it is but I didn't move it across Okay. this is the current sun here we are um, that's the current view of the sun facing the earth there's a handful of sunspots uh, there to the far eastern side of the um, of the image the solar wind is currently at 365.5 kilometers a second at a density of 0.03 protons per cubic centimeter. Pretty empty space. Uh, the sunspot number is 101. The radio sun is at 173 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7. The KP index is 1.67, considered quiet. The 24-hour max is 2.67, also considered quiet. The There was an X-class solar flare and CME, coronal mass ejection, yesterday, a giant sunspot AR3615 produced a, another X1-class solar flare. The explosion on March 28 at 2053 UT ionized the top of the Earth's atmosphere and caused a deep shortwave radio blackouts over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, of greater interest is a CME merging from the blast site. 
NOAA analysts have are modeling the CME to check for a possible Earth-directed component. Um, so um, keep an eye out for more interesting things occurring. I don't think Tamifa has released any recent um, videos. I didn't check, to be honest, but let me just open up Tamifa's channel. And I'll just see if she has a file. Um, nope, there's nothing. She's she's got uploaded. The last thing she last time she uploaded was ten days ago. So, uh, but I'm I bet you she is working on something right now. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, the um, sorry about all the ums. I really hate doing that. I'm trying to avoid it. Um, <laughs> the auroral oval over Antarctica looks like that at the moment so there is a little bit of auroral activity over Antarctica um, there, sorry stomach clean there might be uh, a little bit of glow on the, the horizon uh, tonight and quite possibly tomorrow so for those auroral watches keep an eye out for aurora activity uh, what else where else am I here now um, where's my vmix oh there it is right in front of me um and i'm doing it again now i'm thinking of it oh, where's my camera there we are now what else was it with uh space weather uh space weather oh yeah and the for those that might have missed it last week here is the latest chart for our solar cycle so you can see that the, the top chart is the number of sunspots uh, being recorded as opposed or against the radio astronomy um, or the, the flux, the solar flux measured on, at radio wavelengths, which both marry up pretty close. Uh, but as you can see in that, the peak of the solar cycle 25 is still happening. Uh, the um, It's... Uh, they're, they're predicting that the peak of solar cycle 25 will be in late or about mid-2025. Uh, um, so there's a whole lot of uh, interesting stuff still to occur. And I was listening on 20 metres this afternoon and it, it is buzzing. There's so much pops and scratches and, and funny noises uh, across the band. You can hear it's alive. You can hear that the band is open. And uh, there was a, a station, I was listening to a station from the Netherlands today. He was 20 plus over nine um, and uh, working many stations down this side of, of the world. So uh, most most impressive um, 20 metres at the moment. I think on that I shall cease and desist. Uh, as of 29th of March, there was 2,349 potentially hazardous asteroids. I don't think that figure has changed much in the last few few weeks. So that's space weather in a nutshell. There's going to be more sunspots happening. Uh, that is to say more uh, CMEs and, and uh, um solar bursts and and whatnot happening over this weekend so uh, the look out the amateur bands might completely fade and go into a big blackout <sighs> let me just check my email <coughs> no emails sorry i haven't got discord with me i've just completely forgot to bring discord up maybe i should install it on the computer in front of me here i might do that all right, let's go across to the frequency, 3541 kilohertz, and see if there's any stations wishing to check in for tonight's missions. Um, where are we? Here's the volume. I've got that up, and I think I'm ready to listen. So where's my pen and paper? And uh, see how we go. <laughs> VK3, EKH listening on 3541. Okay, VK3GL, VK3VIN, VK3DX, VK3GOD, VK3SBX, VK3DA, and VK4WXW, was that correct? Okay, 
All right, all right, no worries. Across to you there, Graham. VK3 Golf Limo in Bunyip. VK3 EKH. Yeah, no worries, Gray. VK3 GL, VK3 EK, C, um, them, EKH returning. <laughs> um, thanks for sending that uh, video on 